Returning to the program, um, Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent at Vox. Uh, Ian, so much I wanted to talk to you about today. We're going to get to the uh, to the to the big Chevron case because, frankly, my audience actually is I have hammered them so much over the Chevron doctrine over the years that they you know I had people tweeting to me about this case, but everything I know about the Chevron doctrine I know from interviewing you. So um, uh, thank you so much for coming on today, and um, let's just start. There's so many different things. We, we we just got Judge Stevens's papers released, and even the dogs are aware of what the implications are for Scalia. That is that is your dog actually reading some of Scalia's footnotes, um, and uh, and you know you wrote the book. Uh, years ago, I guess now, uh, the the uh, uh, the injustice injustices the Supreme Court's history of comforting the comfortable and afflicting the afflicted. This was back in 2015. Um, uh, the the court continues. I think both between Stevens and what we've seen in the past couple of weeks about the the corruption continues to make it clear that there is something really really broken with this institution. No, I mean, there, there's been something broken with the institution for a long time. I, I mean, going back at least as far as the Dred Scott decision. But I think what has changed in the last 10 or 12 years or so is that the court has gone from being a very political institution to being a very partisan institution. You know, we're, we're talking about Justice Stevens. One significance of the fact that Justice Stevens stepped down, Stevens was a Ford appointee. And like, you know, there were a few interviews where he actually talked about his policy views and his policy views were pretty doctrinaire Republican policy views. You know, at one point he criticized the minimum wage, but he was considered a liberal justice because he understood that the law is a different concept than what his political party wants. And so up until when Stevens left the court, you still had liberal Republicans. You know, you, you, you still had justices whose votes could not be predicted if you knew the political party of the president who appointed them. And now we have a purely partisan court. You know, the Democratic Party knows what it wants from its justices. The Republican Party knows what, what, what it wants from its justices. They all vote together in like the biggest cases. You know, the only doubt is that when Republican litigants push the fringes of extremism, like we saw in this abortion case, uh, this abortion pills case recently, whether some of the Republican justices will say, well, th that's a little too crazy for me. But, you know, we know what a Democratic justice looks like. We know what a Republican justice looks like. And that's a serious problem, because if this is just going to be a partisan institution, then I don't understand why it should wield any power at all. You know, we, we already have a multi-member body made up of partisan officials who tell us what the law is. It's called Congress. Right. Why do we need a uh, more like... Uh... Everything that this every anti-democratic inclination of the Senate is just sort of distilled down. It's like you put that into a pot and you boil it down to its like essence. And that's what we have, it seems, at the Supreme Court at this point, except for not even elected at that point. Uh, and right. Um, all right. Let's just briefly talk about this. One thing just I, I feel like it's just absolutely necessary to note in the um, the the Bush v. Gore decision, which mm -hmm. is, I think, you know, between that and Iraq, I would not be here. I would be. Uh, I, 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 would, I, I would not be sitting here. Um, that decision. At one point, they're talking about. Uh, th this is just the notes. They're talking about the um, the. Uh, I guess it was uh, uh, black people being disfran disenfranchised. I can't remember exactly what it was. And Scalia writes. I call this the Al Sharpton excuse or something to this effect. It was astonishing to see this guy write in this way. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, you know, we saw him in the Voting Rights Act case, uh, I guess 12 years later, 13 years later, say that the Voting Rights Act is a giveaway to black people, essentially. Right. Um, but... Wait, didn't his fellow justices go like, whoa, dude, I mean, 
you know, can't you keep that under wraps at least? Like, why are you implicating me in how clearly racist you are? Yeah. Or were they just all like, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the dynamics of being on the Supreme Court are difficult because you have to work for this per with this person for the rest of either your life or the rest of their life. And you need to try to get this person's vote uh, in, in future cases. So, like, I understand why the justices tend to play nice with each other, even when, of the when one of the justices is a terrible racist. But, you know, what we have learned about Justice Scalia throughout the years is that he was a terrible racist, you know. And it's not just that, you know, the, the, the specific context that came up in Bush v. Gore is in Justice Ginsburg's dissent, there was a footnote in which she said, I mean, this is a claim that has been borne out by, you know, now that people have studied the election, that there were barriers erected in front of black voters in the Florida election in 2000 that weren't erected in front of other voters. Um, you know, we know that is now true. We know that like there were people who were disenfranchised. They had their names um, removed from the list because they had the same names as as convicted felons. And that disproportionately hit black voters It disproportionately hit Latino voters. Um, so like we, we know that this happened. Scalia dismissed it. You know, he, he, he invoked the name of Al Sharpton. I think it's important to remember this was 23 years ago when Al Sharpton was not, you know, I think, you know, Al Sharpton used to have a show on MSNBC. He's now a major media figure. But at the time, I think his name was widely used by racial conservatives to describe black activists who were too aggressive. Um, and so that was the insult that Scalia intended. And it's just not a surprise. I mean, when there was the big Voting Rights Act case, Shelby County v. Holder, um, in front of the Supreme Court in, in, in 2015, Scalia called the Voting Rights Act, you know, the seminal law that made it, that ended Jim Crow, that made it possible for black people to have political equality in the United States. He called it a perpetuation of a racial entitlement. So, you know, this guy not that long ago was on the Supreme Court. He died in 2016. And we know, you know, he's a smart guy, but he was also a virulent racist. What also struck me about that, and then we'll move on to sort of, was how much the conservative justices were writing that they were like mad at the uh, liberals on the court for calling them out about their involvement in right. that case like it was a classic like people aren't going to feel that the institution is compromised because we messed with something that no one thought we were going to mess with because i remember when that case went up there every legal like dershowitz like you go across the spectrum of of legal commentators was like this is not a case they're, they're going to touch and everybody was shocked that yeah. they touched it, never mind what they ruled. But all the conservative justices wrote that what really undermined legitimacy of the court was the dissenters dissenting and pointing it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I mean, and this is the same debate that we're having now. You know, if you watch the hearings yesterday about the ethics scandals in the Supreme Court, you know, the Democrats were saying, hey, look, justices shouldn't be taking, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars of worth of worth of gifts from um, from billionaires. And the Republicans were saying, how dare you attack Clarence Thomas? That undermines the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. And I guess the question that you have to ask yourself is that, is the court a legitimate institution because it has a mandate from God and we as mere mortals are not allowed to criticize it or, you know, or are not allowed to call into question its legitimacy because this is some divine institution that, you, you know, is beyond criticism, criticism and is beyond losing its legitimacy? Or is legitimacy something that we as citizens of the United States give to our employees on the Supreme Court because they provide us with an important service, because they do their job, you know, in a way that is above board, that respects political, uh, the political equality of all U.S. citizens, that, you know, does not reveal them to be corrupt. And, you know, therefore, the legitimacy is something that we as citizens give to the court and that we as citizens can take away from the court. 
Now, you know, we can debate about whether the legitimacy of the court is similar to the divine mandate of kings, but it happens I have a primary source that supports my argument that is not. It's the preamble of the United States Constitution, which begins with the words, we the people. The United States is a republic. What it means that we are a republic is that the government belongs to us. It is not a divine mandate. It is not handed down from some power up on high. The government is something that we set up to serve our own purposes. You know, the, 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 you know and, and this isn't to say that courts are inherently bad. You know, we, we set up courts for a very good reason, but they are instrumentalities of the people of the United States. And if they aren't serving the people of the United States, if they are self-dealing, if they are taking these outlandish gifts, if they're handing down decisions that cannot comp be uh, comported with the law, if they're in hoc to a political movement and not trying to obey the law as it is written, yes, that diminishes their legitimacy. Because again, we are a republic, not a monarchy. And that means that we own our government. The interesting thing to me about it is, I mean, you you obviously like, you know, you wrote this book in 2015. I mean, uh, criticizing the Supreme Court, not not for the like for its the, the corruption of the institution in the way that it functioned within our society. Not so much for like this, like sort of almost like petty corruption. Right. Um, and this is sort of just like a icing on the cake. Like, I don't think that Clarence Thomas or any of these people fundamentally have altered their worldview because of this corruption. Uh, but I think they get a pipeline. There's a pipeline of just being fed stuff as if like, you know, they're locked in a room with Mark Levin on the radio. And that's the only thing that they're, they're, they're exposed to. It, it seems like a part of a whole rather than a, like a, a like a subset uh, or even, or a, or, or I should say a distinct aspect of the of the corruption of the institution yeah no i mean the way that the court has historically operated is very much in dialogue with the legal profession um and that's you know i mean that's not the ideal circumstance in a democracy where the only way you can have a real influence on the court is through lawyers but it is at least a check you you, you know historically if there was an article that appeared in the Harvard Law Review that criticized the journal, that cri criticized a court decision. The justice would, would at least be aware of it and they would probably read it and, and, and take the criticism seriously. What has happened now is you essentially have two different legal professions. So you have the Federalist Society, which has developed its own rules and its own norms and its own professional and social community so that the way that you become a justice, you know, Brett Kavanaugh is a smart guy. He was not, he is not the smartest lawyer. You know, he's, he's not among the like hundred or 200 or probably a thousand smartest lawyers in the country. He is smart enough to get on the Supreme court. But the reason why he got there is because he has all these professional connections within the Federalist Society. You can say the same thing about Neil Gorsuch. You can say the same thing about Amy Coney Barrett. And the Federalist Society has developed its own alternative set of legal doctrines. It, it's all an alternative set of like what the Constitution means. It is obsessed with these concepts, you know, things like the unitary executive that, you know, don't really matter that much to normal lawyers. And because they've created their own professional community, that means two things. One is it means that these justices can appear internally consistent well, they're still doing very partisan work because what they're doing is consistent with this alternative legal framework that conservatives have come up with. But it also helps keep them in line because, you know, the one thing that matters a whole lot more than whether you're being bribed by Harlan Crow or, you know, or, or like, you know, whether you're getting some sort of like financial validation because you're, you're, you're doing something terrible is whether your friends are going to be happy. You know, people care a lot about what people in their social and professional communities think about them. And if your social and professional communities is all of the lawyers in the United States, you're going to reach more sensible decisions than if your social and professional community is the Federalist Society. 
That that's fascinating. I mean, that's a, 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 a it really is in many ways analogous to what has happened in terms of like the media, where there is a right wing uh, media sphere where you don't have to exit it. It's now completely right. self supporting, and the Federalist Society has created that same sort of like you know having been raised by by lawyers uh, in my life. There was like they they thought they were in a priesthood, and it's just right. that the the these right-wing lawyers, it would appear like they are excommunicated from that priesthood, but it's just the fact is they just started a different religion. Uh, and uh, it is a religion within, you know, it is, it, it's a separate sort of like uh, just section. Uh, they yeah. have sectioned it off so that they can get the exact same type of reinforcement and have the same uh, sort of dynamic, but completely different sets of values uh, that are far less contingent on those sort of classic sort of legal values and more on winning, essentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think like the priesthood analogy is a good one because like essentially what you have going on in the legal profession right now and in the courts is you have a schism. You, you know, I mean, I don't know if this makes Leonard Leo, the chair of the Federalist Society, like the anti-pope. Right. But but, you know, but it, but it's 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 the, it's the same sort of concept where, like, you have these people who are all very well educated, you know, at, by definition, they all have law degrees. You know, they, they are inculcated into a set of rules and norms in much the same way that a literal priesthood is. You know, they have we, you know, we have our own rituals in the legal profession. What do you think the black robes are all about? Um, and what has happened is that you know you essentially have a schism within this legal priesthood where you have a very well organized group of um, of dissidents who think that the doctrine that has been taught by the court for many many decades and the doctrine that has been held as sacred by the legal priesthood for many many decades is in fact wrong and you know we should read the Bible a different way we should read the Constitution a different way and I mean. Schisms are fine. Like it's fine that we argue. It's fine that we argue about religion. The problem is that when the, you know, when the anti-pope, when the when the schisming in priests have the power to tell you what the law is and to veto or rewrite any law, you know, then it's no longer an academic debate. Then it starts to real. Then it starts to impact everyone in the country. Right, and we should make it clear that this schism is not based upon sort of like different. Uh, perspectives on how to approach the law as much as a fundamental, it seems to me, uh, reorienting of the the legal methodology almost um, the 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 approach to what the point of it all is yeah. on some level. I mean, I think to a certain extent, I, I mean, I don't want to go so far as say all law is fake, but like the Constitution is a very vague document. You know, it, it says that the police shall not engage in unreasonable searches and seizures. You know, what what does unreasonable mean? You know, it says that punishments shall not be cruel and unusual. Like, how cruel is too cruel? You know, th there is literally a provision in the, in the 14th Amendment that says that no one shall be denied the privileges or immunities of citizenship. Do you know what the privileges or immunities of citizenship are? Because I don't. It doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution what the privileges or immunities of citizenship are. I can tell you what the Supreme Court has said they are, but what the Supreme Court has said is that they basically don't exist. So, like, you have this extremely vague document, vaguer than the Bible, and you then give these nine individuals the power to issue binding pronouncements about what this document means, and... You know, first of all, it's not surprising that both political parties want to capture this institution because that's just a tremendous amount of power. But more importantly, it means that they aren't really constrained. I mean, they're, they're constrained by themselves. If they choose to follow precedent, they can. If they choose, I mean, you know, after, you know, in the New Deal era, the Supreme Court handed down a lot of very poorly reasoned decisions striking down New Deal policies. There was a major backlash to that. And the I guess the settlement that emerged from the New Deal is the Supreme Court said, we're just going to stay out of, uh, of economic policy altogether. We are going to show judicial restraint. But 
The fact that the justices voluntarily choose to restrain themselves doesn't mean that there's any external force constraining them. And what we're seeing right now is what happens when the Supreme Court is controlled by people who don't constrain themselves and who don't have any external force that can constrain them either. And and I should just say lastly, like, I mean, you know, for the past up until a couple of years ago, really, the the thing that I you would hear constantly from the, uh, you know, conservative judicial minds was the idea of judicial activism. It is fascinating to me how those words have been basically put into like a space capsule and jettisoned. We, I've not heard the words judicial activism in years. And yeah. it was literally the only thing you would hear. I mean, this is what I'm talking about in terms of like what is what is turned like there was always I mean, that was, you know, from Brandeis brief time. Yeah. Like for a long time, there was this sort of like balance. I didn't I never bought it. But at least like that was and then on a dime, yeah, it's gone as soon as they get the keys to the car. So th this is something I write about in my book, Injustices, is that I think that confident political movements tend to speak in the language of judicial restraint. Like if you go back to Franklin Roosevelt, right? Roosevelt had this court that was going after his policy, striking down New Deal policies left and right. They had all of these doctrines like, you know, the Lochner decision, which made it very difficult to have any kind of progressive labor laws. And Roosevelt did not say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to appoint, appoint a bunch of justices who agree with me and they're going to implement my policies from the bench. He didn't say that. He said, I want the court to just stay out of policy making. Let me govern. And the reason why he said that is because he was very popular. He won landslide election after landslide election. You know, for most much of his presidency, he had enormous loyal majorities in, in the Congress. And so he was the head of a politically confident movement. If you look at Ronald Reagan's rhetoric about the judiciary, it's almost exactly the same as Roosevelt. I mean, Reagan also spoke a lot about judicial restraint. And again, like, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Ronald Reagan, but you cannot argue that he wasn't politically ascended. He also won two landslide elections. You know, Republicans had every reason to be confident in democracy in the 1980s because democracy, you know, the, the democratic process was working for them. It was electing Republicans by overwhelming margins. And what has happened now, I mean, in seven of the last eight presidential elections, the Democratic candidate has won the popular vote. If it wasn't for Senate malapportionment, Republicans wouldn't have controlled the United States Senate since the late 1990s. So the Republican Party right now knows it can't win through the democratic process. It is no reason to be confident in its own ability to pull together a political majority. And when you have a party, when you have a political movement that knows that it cannot win through the democratic process, that party basically has two choices. Either it can change its views and try to, you know, say something popular and win that way, or it can say, we're going to look for ways to bypass the democratic system. We're, and, you know, the easiest way to bypass the democratic system in the United States is the Supreme Court. Well, that's a perfect uh, entree into uh, Looper, uh, is it uh, Loper Bright Enterprises uh, v. Raimondo. Again, um, th this, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I am proud that this audience is so sensitive to this issue it is because of conversations that you and I have had really over the past 10 years, it feels like. Um, and, and, and it sort of feels like the moment of reckoning, I guess we're at the beginning of the moment of, of, of reckoning. It really feels yeah. like, uh, I just, uh, tell us about the case. The details of the case are, 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 are really secondary as to what it clearly is set up to tee up for the justices. Yeah. So the background to understand this case is that Congress generally doesn't micromanage every aspect of federal policy. They will announce you know, broad policy goals and frequently delegate to federal agencies the task of dealing with what the details of those policies could be. And you know, sometimes the delegation is pretty substantial. The Clean Air Act, for example, says that certain power plants have to use the best available technology 
to reduce um, certain emissions. And so it is up to the EPA to determine, well, we're going to study what the technology looks like right now. We're going to study you know, what the plants can actually afford to do. And then we're going to say, this is the best available technology right now. And we're going to issue what's called a regulation requiring power plants to use that technology. And then when the technology improves, they can issue a new regulation that imposes greater obligations on power plants. So sometimes these are things that like really matter. I mean, this was what a big recent fight in the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court got wrong about climate change was about. Sometimes these are very minor details, like, you, you, you know, a question of like, and I'm just gonna describe the facts of actual cases, you know, what are the rules for hearings for, um, coal mine workers who want black lung benefits like that. Not all those details are set by a statute. There's a federal agency that determines some of those details. You know, what should the nitrogen emissions be from wastewater treatment plants? That's up to the EPA. So the, there's just a whole lot of this delegation going on. And what the Supreme Court said in Chevron is they said that generally speaking, when we want courts to defer to an agency's determination about what these regulations should be. And the reason why is twofold. One is democracy. One is that while the heads of federal agencies are not elected, they serve at the pleasure of a president who is elected. And so if you don't like what the EPA is doing, if you don't like what the, what the Department of Labor is doing, if you don't like what any federal agency is doing, you take it out on the president in the next election. And, you know, the justices just aren't accountable in that way. The other reason is that these federal agencies actually know what the hell they're talking about. You know, I mean, like, think about the case I was describing. Do you know how much nitrogen should be emitted by a wastewater uh, by a wastewater treatment plant? Because I sure don't. I mean, I have yeah. some ideas. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, no, of course not. But uh, yeah. yes, no, of course not. And yeah. and I wouldn't even begin. I mean, you know, uh, you get the edict of you know Clean Water Act. I wouldn't even know what constitutes like. What drugs, what, what thing, chemicals do I not want in the water right. that constitutes something to be unhealthy? I have no idea. And in fact, or, e even the EPA has to figure out what chemicals are in there because they don't necessarily always know. That was a big part of like the, the whole fracking issue is that they right. were using, we didn't even know what they were poisoning the water with. And you can't just like dip a, uh, a you know, a, a test tube in, into the water and all of a sudden all the chemicals show up. Like this is something that evolves, you know, from yeah. moment to moment even. Yeah, or, or take a case. Here's a case that's in front of the Supreme Court right now. It's called the Sackett case. The issue in this case is it deals with wetlands. So like the problem is like there's not a clear border. If you have a river and like this might be a river that supplies like, you know, an entire, you know, thousands of people with drinking water. You know, it, it's not like there's a clear boundary where like the river ends and the land begins. And if I just, it's okay if I dr dump a box, a bunch of toxic chemicals, or if I do something that, that, that could pollute this river, you know, a mile away from the river, because it's not going to get into the water supply. What you have is that the water, the, the river transitions to a beach, which transitions into wetlands, and you have all these streams and tributaries coming into it. And I could potentially dump a toxic chemical 100 miles away, and it winds up in the drinking supply. And I mean, I don't know where to draw the line and say that, like, look, you can't do any dumping here because it can, it can get into the water supply. You know, who does know how to do that? The, the Environmental Protection Agency knows how to make that determination because they are experts in it. And so what this Sackett case is about, what this uh, this Loper case that we were talking about earlier is about, is whether when you have these really difficult, like, technical decisions, should they be made by experts? Should they be made by, like, the EPA, the Department of Labor, the Department of Health and Human Services, you know, whoever the government officials are who actually know what they're talking about, or should the final word rest with a bunch of lawyers in black robes? But isn't the question of the Chevron doctrine, because there's a there's been like a, a, a fairly recent development of this major questions doctrine. Right. And that feels like the major questions doctrine has been, as far as I can tell, made up of whole cloth over the yes. past 15, 20 years. And it basically says, if we as the court determine that this issue reaches a threshold we have no definition of that threshold. Yes. We know it when we see it. Um, reaches a threshold of being a major question that could be a monetary question. It could be uh, like a social import question. It could be anything, really, yeah. that they determine in that moment 
then we get to decide what the answer is. Their attack on the Chevron is sort of like doctrine seems to me to be dressed up a little bit more where it's like, we can't decide, but Congress has to be very specific about this, which is in practical purposes, impossible. Even if you had uh, 435 members of one party, it still seems it would be impossible for Congress to be able to make a determination and to write legislation that says the definition of clean water is the absence of, and then list every potential chemical that exists in the world now or in the near future or in the far future that could otherwise make drinking water unhealthy. This is just a, you know, extreme example that's impossible to do. And so in attacking the Chevron doctrine, it seems to me the court is hiding behind something they know is impossible, but they, they're not saying we're going to decide. We're just saying that like Congress has to be more explicit when they know that's not physically possible. Yeah, I mean, the, the court, so the major questions doctrine is like, a, is a huge exception to Chevron. Again, the general rule in Chevron is that we want expert agencies making these regulatory decisions and not judges who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, the major questions doctrine doesn't come from anywhere. Like, it's not in the Constitution. It's not in any statute. It's something that the justices just made up. Um, but what it says is essentially when they deem a particular policy question to be major, whatever that means. I mean, they said that it means a matter of vast economic or political importance. Again, whatever, whatever that means. Then the court will essentially veto the regulation. And like they've come up with this rationale to make it sound like it's not a veto, like, oh, we expect Congress to speak very clearly and they just didn't speak clearly enough here. And no, it's just a veto. That That's all it is. It's just five justices on the Supreme Court think this regulation goes too far. So they veto it. That's all it is. So they've already said that they will veto important regulations if they don't like them. What this new case, the Loper case, is about is essentially whether they will also veto unimportant or, or you know, or rel relatively minor regulation. I shouldn't say unimportant, but like the specific issue in the Loper case is fishing vessels are required to allow federal monitors on board who will like make sure that there is an overfishing going on, that, you know, they'll, they'll do a bunch of monitoring in order to make sure that the fishery is sustainable. And the question is whether or not the federal government has to pay in full for this monitor or whether the fishing company that owns the vessel can be required to pay for some of the cost of this monitor. Now, that's not the most important question in the world. Like, you know, the, the world is not going to rise and fall depending on whether or not this monitor is paid by the fishing company. But... The Code of Federal Regulations is 200 volumes long. It concerns all kinds of things. You know, what what kind of safety goggles do certain workers have to you, you know have to have to wear on the job? What kind of you know what what are what are the emission standards for wa for, for, for wastewater plants? What are the rules for one kind of hearing or another? Who's entitled to a certain kind of benefits? And when you take all of that in aggregate. It matters to hundreds of millions of people's lives. And again, the question in this case is whether these very important decisions, which, you know, it doesn't matter to many people wh who pays for the for the fishing monitor, but it matters a lot to the people in the fishing industry. It doesn't matter to many people, maybe how much nitrogen can admit, be admitted by a wastewater plant, but it's probably going to matter to you if you live by that wastewater plant. So these are decisions that in the aggregate matter to everyone in the country. And the question is, are they going to be made by experts who are politically accountable or are they going to be made by unelected judges who don't know what they're talking about and who can't be removed from office? And, and, and we should say that in practice, the major questions doctrine seems to be really almost to the extent that we can tell what it is, can only really be deployed by the Supreme Court, it feels like, because... If it's that major of a question that a court could make the decision, you need to go to the highest court. 
But if the court strikes down the Chevron doctrine or essentially rips it apart and says we're no longer bound by this, then you have federal courts all across the country who can deal. The company says, we want to dump this stuff in the waterway. Right. And Congress didn't say we couldn't dump this stuff. They didn't even know it existed. We just invented it. It's a byproduct. We're dumping it in the waterway. And that, that uh, federal court for that region, essentially, can say, there is no Chevron doctrine. You're right. The Congress didn't say you can't yeah. uh, dump this in there. And then this can happen sort of like under the radar of the national media, the, the consciousness of like everybody. And we will just see this incredible degradation of the administrative state's protection of consumers, of citizens, of, you know, the environment of, of all of it will just be degraded in a way that we can't really even be aware of in the aggregate. Yeah. And the, pro the problem's worse than you describe, actually, because we also have seen this rise of judges who are basically just rubber stamps for whatever conservative litigant comes before them. You know, you, you probably remember there was this big fight about Levy Pristone, the, you know, the, the, the abortion drug. It's a drug that's used in more than half of all abortions in the United States. They got this Christian right organization called the Alliance Defending Freedom went to Amarillo, Texas to file this lawsuit. Well, why did they go to Amarillo, Texas to file this lawsuit? Well, there's only one federal judge in Amarillo, Texas. His name is Matthew Katzmarek, and Matthew Katzmarek hears every single lawsuit that is filed in a federal court in Amarillo, Texas. And he has proven to be, I mean, he's spent his career as a Christian right activist. He is who he is, but he has spent his time on the bench as just a rubber stamp for anything that any Republican litigant asks him to do. He went after birth control. He went after, um, he forced Biden to reinstate a Trump era border policy. He went after Mifi Stone. He tried to strike down the, 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 the ban on, uh, LGBT discrimination by health providers. I mean, this guy's really bad. His decisions have no grounding in the law. And when he issues his decisions, he frequently issues a nationwide injunction, which means that everywhere in the country, whatever, whatever King Matt decides the rule is supposed to be, we all, <coughs> excuse me, we all have to obey King Matt. Now, King Matt's decisions appeal to the Fifth Circuit the problem is the Fifth Circuit is dominated by judges who think the same way that King Matt does. And so they won't reverse them. Then it goes up to the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, it's kind of a crapshoot. You know, in the Mifi Pristone case, they did the right thing because I think the Justice Department convinced them that if that decision stood, it would just create far too much chaos. It would blow up the entire um, drug approval process in this country. But often they just let King Matt's decision stay in place. You know, they let King Matt decide what the uh, what our border policy was going to be for 11 months. They forced, uh, you know, King Matt forced the Biden administration to implement Trump's border policy before finally the Supreme Court stepped in and said, yeah, after 11 months of this, you're right. King Matt's decision was wrong. Um, and so what we're going to have if Chevron is overruled is litigants will find, you know, there's six or seven hundred dis federal district judges in this country. They will find the one judge in the country who will give them what they want. They'll get a nationwide order. And then I mean, maybe you get, maybe you get it overturned on appeal, but that can take months. Uh, and there's a, it seems to me there's a lot less sort of like opportunity for appeal. And also you're talking about some of the most powerful interests uh, in the country, uh, corporate interests. Um, so the, uh, uh, you, you mentioned the Mifa Pristone uh, uh, ruling. What is the what is the status of that? Is that completely resolved? Um, and also, let me just say, I, I I prefer cleric because I really do think that with a with a guy like that, what we're talking about is is a Christian nationalist, and uh, you know, it is um, King almost sounds too secular to me uh but uh but 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 be that as it may where are we on the mifa pristone uh uh case yeah so the mifi pristone case um there's still two more probably two more rounds of litigation that that have to happen but i am optimistic given what the supreme court did that at least this problem is going to go away so 
what happened here is that again, Christian right organization went went to Matthew Katzmarek's chain um, courtroom, and there are all kinds of problems with this lawsuit. I mean, first of all, you have to show that you've been injured in some way by whatever federal policy you're challenging. That's called standing in order to bring a federal lawsuit. And none of these plaintiffs were were injured by, you know, the fact that this drug exists. You know, these weren't people who took the drug. These weren't people who prescribed the drug. So, like, they shouldn't have been in court in the first place. Second of all, essentially what Katzmarek's decision said was that, well, you know, I looked at the research, all the scientific research that the FDA looked at to determine that this drug is safe. But this website called Abortion Changes You did a study, and it found that something like 70 or 80 percent of the women who wrote blog posts on our website about abortion said that abortion they had an abortion and it changed them in a negative way and i think that that study is more reliable than all the scientific evidence that the, that the fda relied on we should so, just say you're not joking yeah i just want to make that clear to people you're not joking that is literally what it, what 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 was the basis of this case yeah, I mean, like, you know, he he came up with some other like it, there were some other like garbage studies that he looked at as well. But like he what he said is essentially I, Maddie Katzmarek, a dude with a law degree and no scientific training whatsoever, no more than the Food and Drug Administration and all of the doctors and scientists who have conducted you know, hundreds of studies on Mifi Pristone. And therefore, I am going to determine that Mifi Pristone is not safe. Now, you know, eventually that went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court <laughs> blocked his ruling. I am optimistic that the Supreme Court has said that they would block it and they're going to hold to that position. What is the process that's going to happen now is this is on appeal to the Fifth Circuit. It's possible the Fifth Circuit will kick out the case, although the Fifth Circuit's very right wing. So it depends on... The Fifth Circuit hears cases in randomly selected three three judge panels. So in the Fifth Circuit, everything depends on who is selected to sit on that three judge panel. And if the Fifth Circuit um, reverses Katzmarek, if they throw his decision out, I think that's probably the end of the case. If the Fifth Circuit does not, it'll go up to the Supreme Court. And given that the Supreme Court has already voted on this once, I am optimistic that the Supreme Court is going to leave me be Stone on the market. OK, um, and we should say I just want to go back the the Loper Bright uh, Enterprises versus Ramondo case, the one that we're talking about in terms of, of the Chevron doctrine that has actually been accepted for next term. So that's, that's going right. to be uh, probably argued in the fall. May, there may be uh, oral arguments in the fall uh, of 2023 and it'll be decided in 2024. What is going to be uh, um, uh, uh, decided in June or July more likely June of this year is Glacier Northwest versus Teamsters. Yep. Tell us about this case. Uh, and then maybe we'll just mention one or two others that you think are really important for us to keep an eye on. But this case seems to me to be over the past couple of years, we have seen a series of cases yep. that were only interrupted by Scalia dying uh, and then uh, of attacks on unions ability to exist to strike, to you know, get agency fees. Uh, this one is really, really strikes at the heart of of the ability of like a labor action. Yeah, that's right. So basically, the I mean, I'm in a union. The, 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 basically, where any union's power comes from is the ability of all of the workers to collectively walk away from the job. Yeah, you, know, you know, I mean, that, that's what that that's what the you know that's the implicit threat. That, that rests over any union contract negotiation is that like, if you mistreat us, you know, if, 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 if we don't like the pay that the page give us what, whatever, all of us collectively will walk away and then you won't get anything done because you won't, you won't have it. You won't have any workers. This case deals with, now there are rules governing when you can and cannot strike as a general rule, a strike is allowed when the workers call for a strike. It is allowed if they call it at a time that'll cost the company money, because, again, the whole point of a strike 
is that you know you you're going to cost the company money through the absence of your labor right i mean if but, you're striking against starbucks you know the idea that uh, you would strike from the you know nine o'clock at night when the store closes until right. six a.m. Exactly. when it opens is absurd. That's not exactly. a strike. Exactly, you strike at the time when it's going to cost the company money. Now there are rules like a union is not allowed to you know if it's a Starbucks union they're not allowed to smash the espresso machine on their way out the door. Like that you know they have to respect the employer's property in that regard. And there are some decisions dealing with very marginal, like I think there was a case at like a lead smelting firm or a lead smelting company where the strike began like as the molten lead was like in the pot being hot and very, very dangerous. And in that case, I think the National Labor Relations Board said like, you, you, you can't pick that specific moment to strike. Like you have to make sure that like there's a minimum amount of safety before you walk away from the job. This case doesn't involve anything like molten lead. This case involves cement truck drivers. And the facts of the case were when it was, when it came time to strike, they took their trucks, they drove them back to the lot, you know, so they didn't like, you know, abscond with the employer's property. They left the drums turning, which is important because if the drum's not turning, then the cement can harden and, you know, then you could destroy the truck. So they didn't do anything to destroy any of the important equipment. The company complains that because the workers weren't there after the cement was mixed, that essentially they lost the value of the wet cement. And that means that the strike was illegal. Now, you know, essentially what they're saying is like, you timed your strike at a time that would cost us money. Therefore, your strike is illegal. And again, all strikes are timed to cost the company money. You know, for the same reason that you don't strike when the store is closed and then end the strike when the store is open, you, you know, if the rule is you can't strike at a time that's going to cost the company money, then you can't have strikes. And if you can't have strikes, then unions are useless because, again, like you know, the, the 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 power that a union has is the power for every worker in the company to say at the exact same moment, "We're going to stop working now." I mean, the uh, it, it is it is so obvious <laughs> like there is no such thing as a strike that doesn't cost money for the employer because right. that's why they have labor to make money and if there's no labor they can't make the money that just right. it, it just seems uh completely obvious so what what is the justification for this case to move forward to the point where the supreme court is looking at it because it really is effectively saying there is no power to strike period, against a profit-making company. Yeah, I mean, I, again, like, there are a few cases dealing with very marginal circumstances, you know, like the lead smelting firm, where, like, it is established that if a union times a strike in a way that could, like, endanger human lives, or, you know, or, or, or that could lead to, like, you know, who know, you know, who knows what happens if you just leave a bunch of melted, molten lead lying around. Like, you know, there are extreme cases where the union has an obligation to like do something with the melt molten lead before they before they go on strike. But this is not this case. This isn't about molten lead. This is about cement. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, well, the point is, yeah. it's not about health and safety. It's strictly right. about the profits of the company. Exactly. And and so what like what is the justification of it getting this far? Because by definition, a strike is to deny capital profits in the same way that the strike also denies workers compensation for working. Yeah, I mean. To be honest, I wish that I had like a lawyerly answer to that question. But like the reason this case has gotten this far is because the Supreme Court hates the hell out of unions. And like, you know, this is another vehicle that gives them an opportunity to in a very technocratic way that a lot of people aren't going to understand, diminish the power of unions. Now, I want to see what the opinion says before I comment on on how bad it is. But like. You, you, you know, again, if like unions have to start timing their strikes to make sure it's not done. I, I mean, I think about, you know, during my last contract negotiation, like it happened to be the case that our contract expired in June. 
And that mattered a lot to me because I'm a Supreme Court reporter and all of the biggest decisions come down in June. So does that mean that I am not allowed to strike in June because I am especially valuable to my company in the month of June, since that's when the most important news happens in, 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 on my beat? You know, they're, they're like, there has to be some kind of line that is clear where the union knows when it's allowed to strike. And I think the thing that I'm most afraid of that we might get from the Supreme Court is a very vague decision where unions don't know when they're allowed to strike and when they aren't allowed to strike. And every time a union calls a strike, it winds up becoming a federal case. But I, if if they decide even in vague terms that like vaguely speaking, the union cannot cause a company to lose money. Then I can tell you like, you know, uh, people can hire me as a strike buster because uh, here's my advice. Wait till it costs you a dollar and then the yeah. strike is illegal and then they come back to work. I mean, it's it, it, game over. It seems to any type of work actions in that respect. Uh, I, I guess it's just like fines being uh, levied on the union, but it really is. It's extraordinary. When will this come out? Will we get the decision? Probably in the next month and a half or so, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the Supreme Court, apparently May 11th, they've been very, very slow this term in handing down decisions. Um, but apparently May 11th, they're going to start handing down at least some decisions every week. I mean, this is a big case. It's a case that's likely to produce, you know, a, a a partisan divide, a six to three divide in the Supreme Court. And so I think that this one's probably going to come down closer to the end of June when, you know, the big decisions come down. Uh, what other uh, big decisions should we be looking out for? Um, because we, we've gone a little bit long here. I really appreciate you hanging with me. Obviously, I, I told you, I warned you right up front that I had a lot of things I wanted to talk to you about. But what other cases should we keep an eye on and and, and uh, maybe we'll catch up with you again yeah. uh, over the next month and a half? I mean, the truth is they've taken so many big political cases this term. It's hard for me to remember them all on, on the spur of the moment. There is they're probably going to end affirmative action in university admissions. Um, there is a big case involving President Biden's loan cancellation program right. and I will just say that I'll just say to anyone who has student loans, if you are planning on that student loan cancellation when you're doing your own finances, don't, because the Republicans on the Supreme Court were pretty clear that I, I think it's very unlikely that the loan cancellation program is going to survive. Let me just ask you one question yeah. on that. That was not, is their decision, there was some controversy as to what authority Biden used on the college loan thing. They used COVID as opposed to some inherent um, power that the uh, Secretary of Education had. But it sounded like in the oral arguments that that question didn't even really come, didn't even arise in the minds of the conservative justices. They were just like, can't do it regardless. Yeah. I mean, I, I can only guess what they're going to say in their opinion. I think that the justices are going to have to be very creative to come up with a way to strike down the student loan plan. And, and then the reason why is because there's a federal law called the HEROES Act. Um, this was enacted in the wake of 9-11. The concern was that there were people who were victims of the terrorist attack, and there were also service members who like may have had a high paying job and were in the reserves, they were called to service, and so they had to go be deployed where they would be paid less money by the military. And this could impact their ability to pay back their student loans. And so Congress passed this law called the HEROES Act that says, if you are impacted by some sort of major disaster or national emergency, you shouldn't be made worse off because you aren't able to pay your student loans. And so the Secretary of Education has the power to cancel loans in connection with this kind of a, a national emergency declared by the president of the United States. The statute is very broad. It says, you know, basically so long as there's a, a national emergency declared by the president of the United States and the secretary of education determines that this loan cancellation is connected to the emergency, that's it. That's all you need. It has all sorts of provisions saying that the secretary doesn't have to jump through the normal procedures. They don't have that. They that, that, that they like. It is very, very clear that the secretary has the power to do this. And so in 2020, 
We had a national emergency. It was the it was the COVID-19 pandemic. Donald Trump was the president of the United States and he declared a national emergency and the Trump administration used the HEROES Act over and over and over again to pause student loan payments. No one questioned when a Republican president was doing it, that the HEROES Act means what it says. And in connection with the national emergency, the secretary has the power to cancel or modify student loan obligations. The only difference in this case is that it's now a Democratic administration doing it. And so I think the Supreme Court is really going to have to be clever to and, write an opinion here. And we should add, too, that in the American Rescue Plan passed in February or March of 2021, Congress uh, anticipated yes. the cancellation of loans, specifically saying that in the event that there are student loans that are canceled up until 2025, they cannot be counted as income relative to the uh, to uh, as far as the IRS is concerned. That, because right. often when you get a loan forgiveness, that can be considered like a gift in kind or a, a you know an expense in kind and that that yeah, constitutes some type of income so they contemplated they reiterated yes. essentially the power uh that the labor secretary had to do this by anticipating it being done and saying if it is done it does not count as income uh, for for federal taxes yeah, that's right. Yeah, this was the 2021 um, recovery bill, the one that was passed at the beginning of the Biden administration. It essentially said, I think it's up up to fifty thousand dollars worth of loan cancellation. If you receive up to fifty thousand dollars worth of loan cancellation, you don't have to pay taxes on it. And I, that provision only makes sense if the secretary has the power to cancel loans. Like, like, like you, you know, it, you, you know, I mean, Congress doesn't pass laws saying like you don't have to pay taxes on your unicorn because unicorns don't exist. Right. You know, the whole premise of Congress saying you don't have to pay lo taxes on loans that are canceled by the Secretary of Education is that the Secretary of Education has the power to cancel loans. Um, so the college loans case, the affirmative action case, uh, any others that right off the top of your head, I won't hold you to uh, a complete uh, exhaustive list. I mean, well, the, the other massive case that that I mean was was scaring a lot of people at the beginning of the term is Moore v. Harper, and this is a case that, in the worst case scenario, like the the theory behind this case is that policies governing federal elections may only be set by the legislative branch in each state, cannot be vetoed by the governor, cannot be um, overridden by the state constitution or the state courts. And, you, you know, if this extreme version of the theory were to take effect, it would mean that in a state like Wisconsin, where you have a very gerrymandered um, state legislature that's controlled by Republicans, but you have a Democratic governor and you have a Supreme Court that's a state Supreme Court that's about to be controlled by Democrats, the state legislature could essentially pass a law saying Wisconsin's electoral votes shall go to Donald Trump. And there'd be nothing anyone could do about it. Now, at the oral arguments, the Supreme Court seemed worried about going that far. I think that we were more likely to get a decision that essentially just, instead of putting state legislatures in charge of every election, puts the Supreme Court in charge of every election. You know, it goes back to what we were saying before with Chevron, where they want to be in charge of everything. I don't even know if we're going to get that anymore, though. And the, and the reason why is that the actual decision on appeal in the Moore v. Harper case was a decision of the North Carolina Supreme Court striking down that state's gerrymandered congressional maps. And the North Carolina Supreme Court, when they struck down the maps, was controlled by Democrats. Now it's controlled by Republicans. Republicans have overturned the previous decision striking down those maps. And so now there isn't even a decision on appeal. Right. They could, they could they could walk away from this. What's yeah. interesting, though, it, in 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 uh, uh, Stevens's papers, it appears that Rehnquist was pushing that independent legislature doctrine in Bush v. Gore as a way of disempowering the Florida State Supreme yes. Court from from 
interfering in Florida's election. Uh, and um, uh, he was he sort of head off at the pass by Sandra Day O'Connor, who sort of got out of the gate quicker uh, with with her sort of decision. But I haven't read into that stuff uh, yeah. enough to really get a sense of it. But it, it, that th that idea has been floating around yeah. to disempower state courts and have like a legislature. I, I, I maybe at another time we can talk about whether that presages the idea that uh, a a legislature can't even delegate authority to um, you know independent redistricting um, uh, commissions is, or something to that effect. Like all the power vests yeah. in when we say you know like legislature like specifically the the lawmakers as opposed to the government of the state right yeah and if i could just talk briefly to what happened in bush v gore i mean what what happened there was that the florida supreme court at the time back in 2000 was dominated by democratic appointees and there was a perception amongst republicans that the florida supreme court was kind of playing fast and loose with Florida election law in order to help out Al Gore. And in some cases, I think Republicans have a point. Um, but the Supreme Court solution, the U.S. Supreme Court solution to that problem was to say, well, the Florida Supreme Court won't make the final word. You know, the Democrats on the Florida Supreme Court won't have the final word. Instead, the Republicans on the U.S. Supreme Court will have the final word. And like, Someone has to decide how our elections result. And I don't think it's great that political parties frequently capture state Supreme Courts and use that power to skew their election law one way or the other. On the other hand, there are 50 different states. And like we don't know before an election which states are going to matter and which, which states don't. I am much more comfortable in a world where... In this election, maybe Florida is the pivotal state and maybe Florida has a Democratic Supreme Court. So Democrats get a little bit of an advantage that way. And the next election, maybe, you know, who knows, Georgia might be the key state and Georgia has a, a Republican Supreme Court. I'm much more comfortable with that world than I am with the world that the Supreme Court seemed to be contemplating in the Morphe Harper argument, which is that all whenever there's a contested election it comes down to the u.s supreme court which is controlled by partisan republicans you know I'd, I'd much rather have a little bit of randomness in our elections than have absolute certainty that the republicans have the final word uh ian melheiser uh thank you so much i really appreciate you going along with me over this stuff uh i find it fascinating i hope people understand the importance of 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 all this um you know if, if for far too long i feel like there people have not understood the implications of who gets to appoint those federal judges to the bench for a lifetime. Um, and I'm afraid that we're going to figure out um, a little too late on the importance of that, at least for, for a generation or two. Um, but uh, hopefully we can reconnect as these, uh, these cases come out. Uh, Ian Melheiser, thanks so much again. All right. Thank you, Sam.